What's up guys, this is Chris McCormick. Welcome to episode seven in my BERT research series where we're gonna to continue to look at the inner workings of BERT. So we're gonna be looking at the architecture details. And in this video, we'll be focusing on the feed forward neural network. That's the second half of the encoder architecture. And then we're also going to look at how BERT handles um, the order of and the you know the relative placement of words in a sentence with uh, something called positional encoding vectors, uh, and then the next episode, episode eight, I'm planning on being the last episode in the series. We're going to cover uh, residual connections in the encoders as well as a technique called layer normalization, and then finally we'll look at the BERT unsupervised learning training tasks. Those were actually kind of a key innovation of um, a BERT over the original transformer. So that'll kind of wrap things up for us. So let's start with the uh, feed forward network. Okay, let's go back to uh, Jay's post and we'll look at this feed forward neural network. So inside the encoder, we've represented it as kind of two separate pieces. We've got the self attention layer down here and then we've got this feed forward neural network. So the word embeddings go through self attention We've got these vectors that represent the words on the output of the self-attention layer. And then they just go through a feed forward network before going on to the next encoder. And, you know, feed forward neural network, this has got a lot of names. You could call it just like uh, dense layers or fully connected layers or, you know, multi-layer perceptron. It's just a very standard neural network and it's applied to uh, each of these embeddings. And it's the same network applied um, to all the embeddings. And we can see this feed forward layer in the weights of the BERT architecture. So we've got the self attention layer, then the output, and then these two guys correspond to that feed forward neural network. So let's kind of um, talk through, you know, the flow of data through this, this model here. So let's say we've got the word draw and we're sending it through self attention and the self-attention actually has, for BERT, we've got actually 12 heads. Um, 12 heads, length 64 each, gives us 768. And so the output of self-attention is actually, you know, 12 of these length 64 vectors. So 0, 1, 2, dot, 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 and then 12. And then the job of this uh, attention output layer is just to recombine those back into a single vector that's 768. Then down here at the bottom, this is these two layers are that uh, feed forward network. So in a you know in a, a simple neural network, this is what we would call the hidden layer. And then this guy is what we would call the output layer. So the hidden layer has got 3,072 neurons. And the significance of that number is that it's four times the length of the embeddings. So four times 768 is 3,072. So the self-attention output gets multiplied against this weight matrix and the output of this hidden layer is a, you know, much longer vector that's length 3072. And that gets fed into the output layer. Output layer has 768 neurons, each with uh, 3000 weights. And so that gives us our final output vector that once again is length 768. And it's this final vector that, you know, kind of goes on to uh, the next encoder. So what is uh, this feed forward network actually doing? Well, uh, I didn't see anything in Jay's post about the purpose of this. Uh, and I also didn't see anything in the attention is all you need paper you know, kind of like neither of those sources explained why this is there or what it does for us. But there's a couple of things we can point out. One is that with the self-attention layer, uh, when we, you know, process the word draw, 
we're pulling in information from every other word in the sentence. So the output of, of this self-attention piece is you know, a weighted combination of the value vectors for every word in the sentence. In contrast, our feed forward network here um, looks at only you know, one word at a time. It's not incorporating uh, information from other words other than what's already, I guess, encoded in, in this vector here. So that's one thing to note. The other thing that's kind of uh, surprising is that if you look at the, um, the total number of weights, so both pieces of the attention layer combined have about 2.4 million weights. And then this guy has about 2.4 million weights. And so does this guy. So within the encoder, uh, two thirds of the encoder's weights are actually in this feed forward network and only one thirds in the self attention piece. So there's, there's a lot of expressive power in these two layers here, uh, but we'll have to keep you know, digging, I guess, to see if we can understand better what, um, what it's doing. So with this next section, we're gonna be looking at how BERT takes into account the order of the words in the sentence. Because uh, with what we've seen so far, we could give Bert, you know, the, the words like we could jumble up the sentence. We could give the words in any order and the result would be the same. So obviously we want to take into account the sequence of the words and uh, recurrent neural networks do that naturally because that's, you know, that's how they work. You feed in the words one at a time. Uh, with self-attention, that's not built in. So we have to do something special to um, give the model some notion of the, the relative positions of the words. Um, so the way we do that is by adding a vector to each input embedding. And it really is just as simple as like adding a vector. Um, and we only do this on the, the bottom most layer. We don't do it in between every encoder, but just at the initial, uh, you know, when we look up the embeddings for our input words, we add this encoding vector, and then that's what actually gets fed into the model. And something really interesting about these encoding um, vectors is that they're not actually learned as part of the model. They're, they're generated by a, a fixed function. So they're kind of hard coded. Um, and the function is pretty convoluted. It, it uh, uses like sine and cosine. Uh, and we'll look at that in a bit. But the, the main thing to know is that uh, the positional encoding at each position, you know, one through 512 is unique. So each, each encoding is unique. And then there's two properties that these uh, encodings inform the model of. The first is like the absolute position of each word in the sentence. And then the second is actually the relative distance between you know, different words in the sentence. So let's look at an example of self-attention and kind of see you know, in more detail what, what this means. So this is a you know example we looked at earlier. We've got this sentence: the animal didn't cross the street because it was too tired. And right now we're processing the word "it." Maybe call that our input word. And we're trying to score uh, every other word in the sentence for relevance. And for this example, let's look at you know the word "animal." So we're we're looking at "it" and "animal." We're trying to score how relevant the word "animal" is to the word "it." So. The, the uh, positional encoding vectors tell us three things. First is that the word it is at absolute position nine. And then the second is that the animal, the word animal is at position one. And finally, it tells us that it and animal are separated by eight words. So to be clear, I don't think this on its own explains you know, how Bert is able to leverage the um, uh, the sequence of the words in a sentence and make sense of it. Because, uh, you know, just knowing that the words animal and it are eight words apart, like that doesn't, you know, immediately tell you how, how relevant the word animal should be. But I think what we're showing here is that Bert at least has access to that information. It, it can look at the order of the words. So I mentioned earlier that these encoding vectors are generated by this, you know, fixed function. Um, and so if you go back to the original attention is all you need paper, uh, here's the definition of the functions that they use to generate these kind of, you know, fingerprints for the different positions. 
So they're pretty convoluted. I was tempted to kind of talk us through the, the function definition, but I don't think it's really important enough um, to, to go into that much detail. Here's what it looks like. You can, you can plug it into Google. Um, I did it here for position 100. So it's, it's just a sine wave that uh, you know, starts out at a higher frequency and it gets lower frequency. Um, the way it's defined in the paper, the reason there's two equations here is that the, the even elements of the signature come from the sine wave and then the odd elements come from the cosine wave. Uh, sort of a, a quirky detail is that that's what they put in the paper, but that's not what they did in the code. So in the code, it's actually like the first half of the signature is the sine wave and then the second half of the signature is the cosine wave and they're just concatenated. Um, apparently, you know, they, they work the same. So the rationale that they give for these two functions in the paper uh, is that they hypothesized that these would allow the model to easily learn to attend by relative positions, since for any fixed offset K, where like if we're doing our example where, you know, animal is word one and it is word nine, then, you know, K equals eight. Then the second word, so the encoding vector for the word at position nine can be represented as a linear function of the first word, the encoding vector for the first word, PU1. For kind of a deeper dive on, on this comment here about the linear, linear combination, there's a, a nice blog post written on this topic. Um, it's, it's more math heavy, uh, and he kind of goes through a, a proof of, of that, that claim. So I'll put this link in the description if you're interested to know more. All right, that wraps up this episode. Again, number eight, I'm planning on being the last one in the series, and we'll get to look at the training tasks for BERT, and I think that'll be pretty interesting. After that, um, I'm planning on publishing a BERT ebook that's a more you know, concise and complete tutorial on the subject. And then Nick and I are also working right now on a named entity recognition notebook, so that should be coming out in the next couple weeks as well. Thanks, guys.